Hello again, everybody. We're going to talk here about CNS infections. We're going to be talking about meningitis, encephalitis, and brain abscesses. Um, so this is all pretty high yield for step two and step three. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel by clicking on the button on the bottom right. You'll get updates as I put more and more videos up, notifications and whatnot. Um, so definitely feel free to subscribe. All right, so let's talk about infections of the CNS. This can include infections of the meninges. It can be infection of the brain parenchyma, which may be generalized in the form of encephalitis, or it may be a focal infection, uh, essentially an abscess of uh, the brain parenchyma. The general symptoms of a CNS infection are fever and a headache. All right, now, when we're talking about meningitis, it's going to be more fever and a neck ache. Uh, but fever and a headache are, are, are pretty typical symptoms. Sometimes the headache, like I said, may be a neck ache. Sometimes the neck ache may be appreciated as a headache. The other symptoms will uh, depend on the etiology or the nature of the disease. All of the infections of the CNS have a very high mortality rate if they're not treated. So this is very, very important that you pick this up. There are a variety of populations and each of them have their quirks as to how this may present and what pathogens they're susceptible to. And that's going to be essential to understand when we go after treatment. Okay, so we'll talk about meningitis, encephalitis, and brain abscess, and there will be some other things that are a little bit lower yield. I will point those out, uh, but for the most part, we want to focus on the most common um, disorders and the most common causes. So we'll start with meningitis. The number one cause overall is strep pneumoniae. Don't let that word confuse you. Strep pneumoniae can cause things other than pneumonia. In adolescents and younger adults, the big cause is Neisseria meningitidis, which has a unique presentation, and then in neonates, group B strep, strep A galactiae. Some other prominent causes, um, if we're talking about children under the age of two and older people, over 55, over 60, uh, we need to consider the possibility of listeria. There are a number of viruses that can cause meningitis. Staph aureus is a concern in post-operative patients if you fail to uh, adequately use aseptic technique. And cryptococcus can show up in HIV patients, does not occur in the general population. Some other important causes of meningitis, we'll get to some of these. Rickettsia causes Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Borrelia burgdorferi causes Lyme disease. Treponema pallidum causes neurosyphilis. Uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis causes TB meningitis. And Nigleria filari causes primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. Big word, uh, but basically that's an amoebic encephalitis. And we'll talk about each of these. You should understand um, the presentation for each of these because meningitis is just one thing, one way that these can present. Most of these things, probably with the exception of nigleria, uh, will have other presenting signs as uh, they usually present uh, in other ways uh, as opposed to meningitis. So meningitis is an inflammation of the meningeal lining. Typical presentation is fever, headache, stiff neck. Better word is nucorigidity. They can have nonspecific symptoms like nausea and vomiting, photophobia. Positive Koenig sign, you usually won't see this too much, but uh, what you do here is you flex the hip and extend the knee, and that will usually elicit pain. Uh, then there's the Brzezinski sign, which is involuntary leg lifting with flexion of the neck. Some of these patients may have a rash. We'll get to why that's important. So you always want to make sure you do a very thorough dermatologic exam, especially when you're dealing with a young patient because meningococcal meningitis may show a rash. 
Usually the best initial diagnostic test when you've got a, paper, a, a patient with a fever and a headache is going to be a lumbar puncture. As long as you don't suspect any kind of uh, elevated intracranial pressure, you're not seeing papal edema, you're not seeing focal signs, you can go ahead and get a lumbar puncture. However, if you see anything that makes you suspect that you've got a patient with elevated intracranial pressure, you must, you must get a CT first. Because if you do a lumbar puncture on a patient with elevated ICP, you can kill them. The most accurate test for meningitis is a CSF culture, but this takes a long time to come back. So we generally will do a CSF analysis and then we will treat them presumptively. Blood cultures should also be obtained, obviously, and you need to do that uh, before starting antibiotic therapy. This is the purpuric rash that shows up in meningococcal meningitis, which is caused from Neisseria. Now, one of the complications of meningococcal meningitis is waterhouse friedrichsen syndrome. I talk about this in my adrenal talks, um, but it is uh, a very feared complication. It can result in adrenal insufficiency due to hemorrhage into the adrenal glands. Um, the mechanism is not as important. What is important is you understand that these patients will be adrenally insufficient, and this is often fatal. Now, reading a CSF analysis is going to be of the utmost importance to you on any of the three steps of USMLE. What we're looking for here is protein, glucose, and cell count, and you need to remember if you're taking CCS, you need to order all three of those individually. Unfortunately, you can't just say CSF analysis. It's CSF protein, CSF glucose, CSF cell count. Protein will be elevated in all causes of meningitis, whether that be septic or aseptic. Um, so viral, fungal, TB, a bacterial, you'll always have elevated protein. A negative protein is not consistent with any type of meningitis. Glucose, if it's normal, it suggests a non-bacterial cause. If it's low, it suggests bacterial or fungal. If, uh, so, so the way I think of it is organisms like to eat things. What do they like to eat? They like to eat glucose. Well, viruses don't do that because viruses are not really organisms. So bacterial and fungal, you'll have a low glucose. Everything else, you should have a fairly normal glucose. And the cell count is the most important because this will help you differentiate between the different causes. So bacterial, you should have neutrophils or PMNs. Viral, you should have lymphocytes. Staining can also be done, serology, immunologic studies, um, but those are secondary. So here's a, an example here of uh, these different types of meningitis. All right, so uh, when do we do a gram stain? Well, gram stains aren't particularly useful, but they are very, very sensitive. So you cannot rule out meningitis with a negative gram stain. However, if you have a positive gram, gram stain, uh, then you're likely dealing with some kind of an infectious meningitis. Uh, these are some examples of how they may tell you. Uh, so on the USMLE, they don't tell you the organism, they tell you how it looks. Big ones here are the gram-positive diplococci, that's strep pneumoniae. Gram-negative diplococci is Neisseria. What do we do for treatment? Um, so the presumptive treatment is going to be vancomycin and ceftriaxone. Okay, got to know that. You can also add steroids. It helps with inflammation. Um, and then if the patient is very susceptible to listeria, so if they're under three months or over 60 years, or if they're immunocompromised, which includes alcoholics, you're going to add ampicillin onto the vanc and ceftriaxone. Now, for other causes, if it's viral meningitis, we just do supportive care. If you're doing, dealing with cryptococcal meningitis, um, that you're going to treat with amphotericin B. Remember, amphotericin B is sort of our hardcore antifungal that we use for life-threatening fungal infections. Lyme disease will usually go with uh, ceftriaxone. Um, you can also use doxycycline. Uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is levofloxacin or doxycycline. TB, we're going to go with the quadruple therapy and syphilitic meningitis. We do high-dose penicillin, and that's got to be IV.
Patients should be advised to regularly follow up because there are neurologic sequelae, particularly seizure disorders and sensory neural hearing loss. I think it's about 10 to 20 percent uh, with meningococcal meningitis. With viral meningitis, um, this rarely requires treatment. All right, so some causes of encephalitis, it's usually viral. So we look at West Nile, that is now the most common cause in the U.S., we also look for HSV, CMV, particularly in immunocompromised patients, and varicella zoster. This is inflammation, generalized inflammation of the brain parenchyma, which results in neurologic dysfunction. Typical symptoms here is going to be what you see in meningitis. However, on top of that, they're going to have altered mental status. It is very, very similar appearing to meningitis, and often you can't differentiate the two until you get the lumbar puncture. The best initial diagnostic step is a CT. You got altered mental status, you're gonna get a CT. CSF is often needed to differentiate from meningitis. The analysis will show a viral picture. So we see the high protein, high lymphocytes, but normal glucose, because remember, viruses don't eat. The most accurate test is going to be a PCR of the cerebral spinal fluid. That's why we get the lumbar puncture in addition to helping us differentiate. Uh, the treatment here is going to be a cyclovir. Um, now, we do treat viral encephalitis. We do not necessarily treat viral meningitis. Uh, you will give adjunctive steroids, so dexamethasone. And what we use uh, for CMV encephalitis, particularly, which you will see in immunocompromised patients, is ganciclovir or foscarnet. Now, a lot of people think, oh, we, do gan we can do ganciclovir if we have a patient with acyclovir, uh, I'm sorry, with, with uh, let's say, herpes encephalitis. Um, that's resistant to acyclovir. And the answer to that is no, we do not do that. If you have a patient who has um, HSV encephalitis and you do a viral culture and you do sensitivities and it's acyclovir resistant, you go to foscarnet. You do not go to ganciclovir. Ganciclovir is for CMV disorders. So CMV retinitis um, and encephalitis as well. Seizure precaution should be taken in patients who have elevated ICP. This is herpes encephalitis. And the classic way that this shows up is this enhancement along the lateral parts of the brain. So it looks like that. This is very, very classic. And you should understand how this looks on uh, CT and MRI. Now, brain abscess, the most common cause is polymicrobial. So not a single cause. However, there are a number of other causes. So you look here, you got some enteric causes, gram-negative causes, staphylococcus, particularly after a neurosurgery, and fungal causes, particularly for immunocompromised. This is a focal infection, and it usually occurs in immunocompromised people, IV drug users, and neurosurgery patients. The symptoms here are similar to what you see in meningitis and encephalitis. However, here you can see focal deficits. Why? Because this is a space-occupying lesion. Okay, it's not a tumor, but it is still a space-occupying lesion because you have this big old abscess that's compressing this fixed space. Now, the best initial test here is a head CT. However, MRI is superior. This will clearly display the abscess. Now, if you have a positive CT, what we do next depends on the patient. So if the patient is HIV negative, we give antibiotics, and then we go on to get a brain biopsy, so refer to neurosurgery. If the patient is HIV positive, we assume that it's toxoplasmosis. We treat them empirically. If the symptoms go away, it's toxoplasmosis. Okay. Now, remember with toxoplasmosis, uh, on imaging, you'll see ring-enhancing lesions. So very, very important to understand the bacteria that's present because it's important for the appropriate care of the patient, but empiric therapy should not be delayed. You never delay empiric therapy waiting on to figure out what the exact cause is. You start empiric therapy, once you find out the exact cause, sensitivities, you can adjust your antibiotics accordingly. All right, now most patients, we're gonna use ceftriaxone and metronidazole. Why metronidazole? Because we have to cover anaerobes. We don't have to do that in meningitis. So ceftriaxone and metronidazole, 
if there is a penetrating injury, then we'll use ceftazidime uh, instead of ceftriaxone. Now, if the patient is HIV positive, as I said, we treat them presumptively for toxoplasmosis. That is done with pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine. Know that. That's an important combination. For the treatment, we will use anticonvulsants because these patients are at risk for seizure. You can do that with phenytoin, PO. We'll refer them to neurosurgery for drainage, and routine use of corticosteroids is not recommended in brain abscess. If you recognize a fungal source, then you're going to go with amphotericin B, but that's only if you recognize the fungal source. We do not use amphotericin B prophylactically uh, or empirically because... This is a very, very toxic drug. We want to avoid using it if, if we can. This is a ring-enhancing lesion. This is probably toxoplasmosis. This is how it will show up. And you see another one here. And another one here. And here you see multiple. So some hints here. Um, I'm not going to read through all these, uh, but I show the meningitis here. You can see these different patients that may show up to you on a vignette, uh, what you really need to think of. Now, that's not necessarily saying that if you've got a young person that it has to be Neisseria meningitidis. That's not to say if you've got an HIV patient that it has to be cryptococcal meningitis, but these are stereotypic ways that they show up. Uh, with encephalitis, you have to keep in mind some of those zebras, so Nigleria foleri, the primary amoeb amoebic meningoencephalitis, look for anosmia, in a swimmer, somebody who swam in fresh water. Uh, remember that Nagleria foleri gets into the brain through the cribriform plate. And so it's going to damage the, uh, the nasal mucosa. And so these patients will have anosmia. Remember the centripetal rash in a camper, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, joint pain in a targetoid rash, think Lyme. And then some of these different causes of brain abscess. Remember, usually it's polymicrobial. HIV patient think toxoplasmosis. And then this is just a recap of what we went through. Some of these things we didn't touch on as closely, but this is kind of a good cheat sheet for you. I just want to point out here, Lyme encephalitis, we use doxycycline in pretty much everyone over the age of eight. If they are under the age of eight, you should go with ceftriaxone. The American Academy of Pediatrics is now saying maybe doxycycline might be safe. Um, if you're using it for just a short period of time. But for the exam, just go with ceftriaxone. Don't give doxycycline to a kid, okay? Don't try to outsmart the exam.